I am so excited, um, probably a little bit nervous uh, about, amped up, let me say amped up, about getting back into the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it has been such a wonderful adventure, and, uh, and I'm happy to be back. Our summer of marriage was fantastic, and I know there's fruit that's going to be born from that, from that sowing, and, um, but I'm happy to be back in the Gospel of Mark. You know, the one thing that the Lord told me, He said, serving others is not about neglecting yourself, but about loving God enough to give your best to others. And it's important because God wants you to be great, but according to His definition of greatness, not what the world defines as great. And so if we will stand for the anchor scripture, this is the word of the Lord that describes and tells us. His word tells us what it means to be great. And if we can read this together as the body, we'll begin. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom forever for many. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that good word. So we're going to start. We're in Mark 10, 35, and we're just going to walk through it like we do. <clears throat> So Mark 10, 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I want you to pump the brakes right here. Can you maybe see that this is not going to go too well? You see, when the, the word then, then James and John, in the Greek, the word then is used as an, as an uh, adversative. The definition of that, it's expressing opposition to the previous statement. So then you ask yourself, well, what was the previous statement? Like, what are they so adverse to that was said just before this? Well, let's go back to Mark 10, 33, 34. Behold, this is Jesus. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Like Jesus has just predicted his death for the third time. He just predicted his death for the third time. And them old boys were like, yeah, yeah. But this is what we want you to do. You see, they dismissed Jesus' prophetic declaration. And they focused on themselves. How many times do we dismiss God's word in lieu of our wants? How many times do we, do we seek that prophetic word or, or that revelation from Scripture? And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, don't do that. How many times do we, do we put God's word in our pocket because it's just not good enough? You see, this one sentence says so much about the way that most believers approach Christ. What will you do for me? Like if God never answered another prayer, would you simply love him for who he is instead of what he can do for you? I encourage you to let this example be a self-reflection, to be a litmus test as to whether Christ is first in your life. Is he first in your life because of who he is or because of what you want him to do? And I'm not saying this with condemnation. I'm praying that this brings some correction. We seek the Lord's word as long as the word is what we want the Lord to give us. I ask you to open yourselves up to be receptive to whatever the Lord has to say to you. And we'll continue and we'll, in the 1035. And it says, um, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Like this isn't a friendly favor. I'll call Terry Camp all the time and ask him a friendly favor. And he says, after three breakfasts and two lunches, I'll think about it. Now, these brothers are very assertive. I want to go to the Greek where it says we want. In the Greek, it's thelo. It's to exercise the will, an unimpassioned operation. To do, in the Greek, is peo, to exercise authority or power. Does any of this sound friendly or kind? We ask. In the Greek, it's aeto, to request, to demand, to desire. 
Where do you think these brothers' hearts are? Are they, are they kingdom focused? Are they self-serving? You see, I'll share with you. The night of the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples in John 14, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I'm going to tell you that this is a scripture that I think is misused sometimes. I think it's misaligned sometimes. We skip some of the stuff. and we, Well, he said he was going to do it. You said you were going to do it. But we're missing. You can't take stuff out of context. You see, what is the key to asking, to praying? That the Father may be glorified. Nothing else. That the Father may be glorified. Do you think James and John's request was to glorify God the Father? Do you think they even realized what they were asking for him to do? You see, in the Greek, the word the glorified is uh, doxazos. It means to, to magnify, to adore, to worship, to glorify by admission to a state of bliss. Does that sound like, does that sound like something that would have glorified God the Father? Like, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. Look, parents, y'all know, if your kids come to you with a, when they start off their, their questions like that, don't agree. Hey, mom, I want you to do whatever I'm going to ask. Yeah! Don't fall into that trap. I will venture to say, some of us probably have. But you see, this is not to beat down onto these two brothers. This is not to condemn these two brothers. Okay? They're very ambitious. We've already seen a situation back in Mark 9 where they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. But you see, this example, everything in the Holy Bible is meant as a mirror for us to check what we reflect. You see, I'm not telling you this story so you can hashtag over religious and say, well, I would never do that to Jesus. Because I'd venture to say, we have. This holy word is a check for what you reflect. And if you see a little bit of yourself in this, don't take it as condemnation. Take it as conviction so you can make correction. In all of our prayers, I get asked a million times, man, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I'm praying and ain't nothing happening. I ask yourself, is what you're praying meant to, number one, glorify God the Father? You see, so often we demand that God perform to get us out of a crisis. We end up falling back into that crisis and then another crisis and another crisis. Is that honoring to God? I will tell you that Jesus is not a a circus magician who's trying to, to please and impress the crowds. This is not about you. It's about glorifying God the Father. How do we stop that cycle of crisis after crisis after crisis? So often, and I've lived it myself. Like I know what I'm doing is wrong, and I want to stop. But I just can't. You see, you're relying on your, your flesh. You're relying on your own natural ability. Romans 12, 2 tells us what? Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, the big challenge for believers is renewing your mind, retraining your brain. Why? Well, from birth, we're born me, 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 baba, me ho, me this, me that. And we never break out of that in the natural. Because in the natural world, it's meant to satisfy me. Me, 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 me. That is not kingdom. So when you come into the kingdom, it takes a renewing of the mind. you got to stop, God, I want. God, I need. God, do this. God, do that. We just keep falling into these emotional cycles of crisis and failure. So what breaks the pattern? I've shared before. It's called neuroplasticity. 
It's rewiring your brain. Your mind has the ability to be rewired. I've shared, I've worked with guys who, who are addicted, struggling with pornography. And like, well, I guess I was just born an addict. And I don't care if it's that or if it's drugs or whatever it is, whatever the addictive behavior is. I guess I was just born an addict. You were not. That beautiful gray baby brain matter was not formed to consume addictive content. There was unintended or intentional exposure at some point. For most people, it's about the age of eight when they're first exposed to this stuff. And then it creates a, a curiosity. And maybe there's an, a, there's an intentional refeeding or there's just a curiosity receding. But you start, to, you start to feed that into the brain. And then the brain starts to want that. And then that's where it comes with neuroplasticity. You see, because of the stimulus that's been presented to your brain, your brain's thinking about that. Look, I would have never imagined I would love quantitative statistics. Multivariate regression models and, and, and different formulas for quantitative statistics. I would have never imagined in my life that this simple man from South Louisiana Bayou country would have a love for quantitative statistics. But you know what I did for seven years in graduate school? I worked with numbers. I fed my brain statistics, and I developed an appreciation for statistics. You know what I'm trying to do now? Is get rid of that love for statistics. <laughs> but this is where rewiring your brain comes from. This is called neuroplasticity. It is a scientific term, but more important from Romans 12 too, it is a biblical concept. You've got to retrain your brain. Now, how do you do that? Well, I will tell you. It's what you feed it. It's what you feed it. You want to stay addicted to pornography? Keep clicking pornography. You're like, well, well I just can't stop. Yes, yeah, start reading the word of the Lord. Start reading the word of the Lord. Your mind's going to start receiving that. It's going to start rewiring itself to where it's not going to want this anymore. And look, not just that, like, like, like mainstream media, social media. Like who's been glued to the tube since that assassination attempt? Like we're so locked in, four in the morning, we're going to, we're going to social media to see if some, some hack reporter found out the identity of maybe a second shooter. I will venture to say, probably spent more time researching that than researching the word for today. I will tell you that the news cycles are 24-7. They're fleeting. It's some anonymous person you don't know who's going to put a tweet out there that you're going to cling to for the whole day. Instead of going to this eternal word from the God you do know that's never changed and never will change. You're looking for answers? Look in the book. Look in the book. Renew your mind with what this says. Renew your mind. I want to tell you, in 2018, there was a South Korean study. And I know you guys have heard about this over the years with plants. They took one plant over here, and it was negative talk, curses and bad talk. And there was another plant, plant, and, and it was affirming words, and it was good conversation. Do you realize, you know this, that the plant with the affirming words grew healthy, bore fruit? Now, if a plant responds by renewing its mind, what do you think our souls do? What do you think our brains do? Like, this isn't playing games. We can keep falling into crisis after crisis and keep dragging ourselves through the door every Sunday morning and woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Or you can renew your mind Amen. and you can, you can rewire your old thinking, stinking with the good word of the Lord. Yes. Read the Bible. Read it aloud. Don't worry about mispronouncing the names. Come on. Come on. Pray aloud. Talk to other believers aloud. It saturates your mind with God's Word. There's an old saying. It's called uh, G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. But you know, I challenge you, church. God in, God out. I talk to guys all the time. They're like, man, my friends don't even call me no more. Which friends? The bad friends. <laughs> Good. Because they don't want to talk to me. Why? Because all I talk about is Jesus. Really, what else is there to talk about? What, is that, what else is there to talk about? 
You know, I'll tell you, let's go back to prayers. Unmet expectations. The biggest source of unmet expectations is unanswered prayers. One of the biggest reasons that people leave God, they walk away from God, is because He didn't answer my prayers. He didn't give me what I wanted. I must be doing something wrong, or He just ain't listening. You see, prayer is not about making a wish list. It's about building a relationship. What I want to tell you, I'm going to drop a truth bomb. God answers every prayer. Come on. Come on. No Come on. is an answered prayer. That's right. That's it. No is an answered prayer. But it doesn't mean that you're rejected. It usually means that you've been protected. You've been protected. You see, even Jesus got to know. Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further and he fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, hmm, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, in his humanity, Jesus prayed out to his Father, like, Father, is there any other way Is there any other way besides this brutal crucifixion? And the answer was no. No, son. No. The the glory of God would only come through his son's willingness to give his life as a final sacrifice for sin. Honestly, a lot of times we really have no clue what we're asking for. We're asking out of emotion. We're asking out of crisis. We're not allowing our our spirit to lead us in our prayers. We're allowing our emotions, our latest need, our latest emotional news cycle to lead our prayers. Like James and John, they're asking Jesus to let them go through the same crucifixion that he's about to endure. Do you think these old boys know what they're talking about? No, they're just asking out of emotion, out of worldly desire. Mark 10, 38. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? You see, Jesus says no was not a rejection. It was protection. God treasures our our prayers. They're not discarded. They're stored in heavenly bowls. They're precious fragrances that are offered to God. Revelation 5, 8 tells you, And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense. Do you know what that incense is? It is the prayers of God's people. I will tell you that whatever prayer that you prayed as a two-year-old or a four-year-old or an 87-year-old, every one of those prayers are contained in a gold bowl in heaven. Do not ever imagine or believe that your prayers are wasted. No is an answered prayer. Now that you know that every prayer ever uttered is is preserved in a gold bowl in heaven. I just want you to take a second. I want you to, only you know your prayer life. I want you to think about your prayer life, your prayer frequency, and what that bowl looks like in heaven. Does it look like an ocean, or does it look like a thimble? If your prayer life would fill up a thimble, you can change that starting today. You can start pressing into prayer. You can start pressing into faith. You can start pressing in, in boldness, knowing before you ask anything, understand and agree that it's to simply first glorify God the Father, not to glorify yourself. So Mark 10, 36, 37, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You see, the right and left hands of Jesus, those are positions of favor and power. According to the world, 
the proximity to the worldly king meant your, your proximity to power. Number one, what they didn't realize was God the Father had already picked two other people, two thieves, to be at his right and left hand at the time of crucifixion. You see, that's how the world does it. If I can be next to the king, then I got the power. But you're trying to get close to the wrong king. You see, we all have a place in the kingdom. You see, they're asking for Jesus when he's in glory. And they're asking glory because they don't understand. They still don't understand who he is. They're waiting for him to overthrow, uh, overthrow Rome and become the earthly king. And I guarantee you they've already got their crowns and their, and their robes and scepters picked out. They probably got the pointy shoes that curl up in the front. Like I'm sure they got it all worked out. Because Jesus is going to be the king according to who we want him to be. And we're going to be right there with him. What I want to tell you is until you honestly know who God is, you cannot truly be in a relationship with him as the sovereign God. Amen. You see, God, for most believers, is a product of their imagination or their fantasy. He's a little genie in a bottle. He's a little God that pops out of the closet when things get bad. You cannot create God as you demand him to be. When you do that, the God of your imagination becomes an idol. I want to give you an example. There was an all-American Notre Dame football player wound up going into the NFL as a linebacker. This guy was renowned. And he fell in love with a woman. Over four years, he courted her in an online relationship. They had big plans. Big plans. He was going to sign a big contract. He was actually in his senior year. He was a Heisman Trophy candidate. They picked four of the best football, college football players in the nation. As a linebacker, he was one of the four best players in this country. And, he, and he, was, he was in love. And this girl that he loved over four years, this online relationship, she tragically died of leukemia. This is a college girl who died of leukemia. This guy dedicated his senior year to the love of his life. He played like an animal, like a wild man, to honor her memory. What I will tell you is that she never existed. It was a hoax. Some deranged man in another college created this figment of his imagination. This girl never existed. She was a hoax. You see, he created a fantasy version of this woman without ever truly knowing if she existed or who she was. It happened in college football. It happens in our faith walk. And it's happening with the disciples. Church, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Take the complication out of religiosity. Kick religiosity to the curb. Simply let God be who he says he is. Amen. Amen. This, he tells us who he is. Read this. Get rid of the complications. Simply let God be who he says he is. Mark 10, 38. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? I want you to, I want you to recall the first time that, that Jesus had prayed and received a no. And then he prayed it twice because he knew what he was about to get, go through. Yet his disciples are asking to experience the same suffering and death. Then Matthew 26, 42, again, a second time. He went away and prayed, we're talking about Jesus, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. What is the cup in the baptism that Jesus is talking about? The cup represents the suffering and the divine judgment that Jesus would endure by going to the cross. 
Church, I want to tell you that only Jesus can drink from that cup and be baptized with the baptism. Only Jesus can bring salvation. There's nothing those brothers can do. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing this world can do to earn, to get gifted, to get granted, to deserve salvation. John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to tell you that had God answered this prayer, had God answered the request of these two brothers, they would have been tortured. And they would have been crucified. But they would have simply remained dead. Could we say we're not the way. They were not the truth. And they were not the life. See, the disciples could do nothing to bring salvation. They could only wait to receive it. I want to tell you that, that the, the fruits of salvation comes in our good works. And we should do good works. But don't confuse your good works as that which brings you salvation. Salvation is a gift. And it was earned through Jesus' cross going to the Christ. Receive the free gift of salvation. And I don't just mean eternal life. I mean the Greek, the sozo. All the goodness of salvation. The protection, the provision, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Like, like so, eternal life is more than waiting to drop dead. To let this skin suit fall to the floor so your soul will live in eternity. The second, the instant, the, the, the moment that you receive Jesus Christ... Your soul began an eternal life with God. You were living that eternal life in the soul with God the Father. Live it in all of its greatness as it's defined by God the Father. You see, Jesus is telling them, oh, you will. You are going to drink from a cup. And you're going to experience the baptism. You're going to get the suffering. You're going to feel the persecution. Just not now. Acts 12, 1, 2 tells us, Herod's violence to the church. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. How different are these two brothers' lives from this moment of ambition to that moment of persecution. You see, an early Christian author, Tertullian, wrote about 200 A.D. that John was at one point immersed in hot oil but suffered no harm. John was eventually exiled to the island of Patmos where he received visit, uh, visitation, uh, vision, and he wrote the book of Revelation. It is believed that he is the only disciple of the disciples that were able to live out a long life instead of a martyr's death. But believe me, he still suffered persecution. Was Jesus' no that first day of rejection? No. It was protection. It was protection. Mark 10 40. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. You see, because kingdom assignments are not based on the world's standards of promotion, the fact that James and John are two of the three closest to Jesus. Like, these are his boys. These are his padnas. It doesn't mean that they've earned prominent positions. I'll tell you, a lot of times at church, it gets that way. Well, I fed the pastor lunch three days. How come I'm not the next this or the next that? Because if you've got a church that's listening to the Holy Spirit, these assignments are not man-appointed. They're God-anointed. You see, leaders are not esteemed in God's kingdom. They're meant to be servants. And they also suffer greatly. Jesus is only here to do His Father's will. Determining who gets what role is not Jesus' role. We did not come to be esteemed on this earth. It's important for us to remember that. We are to seek and to do God's will. Not to try to bend His will to what we seek. Amen. If your prayer life feels like it's bouncing against the roof, the ceiling, 
and you're getting disappointed because of unmet expectations? Well, he said whatever I asked, he'd do. Huh. Ask yourself, is everything that comes from you meant to glorify God the Father? So Jesus, he reteaches them what kingdom greatness is. Mark uh, 10, 41, 44. And when the ten heard it, now look, we didn't even talk about his ten panas. These twelve cats have been rolling together for about three years. And them two slip off over here and they get a little alone time with Jesus. And their ten brethren, they just kind of get left behind. But they heard it. They began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Well, I guess so. But Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, You know that those, that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. What I want to tell you, it's okay to be awesome. It is okay to be awesome. I met a guy about a month ago, and we become friends. And he told me, he said, he said, I was trained as a butler. My professional occupation was as a butler. Personally, I've never met a butler. And he goes, you have. You. He said, you're called to serve. And I appreciated that distinction. What a noble calling that we all have. We've been called to serve. This is our professional training to learn to serve, to not be served. And in learning to serve, it's okay to be awesome. You see, God wants you to be great as he defines greatness, not as the world does. What's beautiful is Jesus doesn't rebuke James and John for their request. Actually, what he does, he harnesses their ambition, and he redirects it in the right direction. You know, I always say, you cannot push a rope. As hard as you try, you cannot push a rope. These brothers are not ropes. These brothers have ambition to serve. It's just a little misdirected right now. I'll tell you, a lot of us have an ambition to serve. And it might be a little misdirected, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means we need some correction, some direction. I shared this when we went through Mark 9. It says, who is the greatest? And you'll remember they were all arguing. They were all bickering. And Jesus like, what are y'all arguing about? And, you know, like our kids, they start pointing at one another. And, but Mark 9, 35 says, and he sat down, called the 12 and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all, and servant of all. This was just in chapter 9. And now we're revisiting this in chapter 10. You see the kingdom paradox? You want to be first? You got to be last. The reason it's hard to receive is that it's countercultural. We grow up the best. We idolize sports. Like, like, let me ask you. I don't know. Two years ago, who lost the Super Bowl? Last year, who lost the NBA Finals? I don't know. Because nobody cares about number two in the world. It's countercultural. I want to ask you, do you accept Jesus' definition of what it takes to be great? Are you willing to be great for God? Are you willing to be servant and least of these? I will tell you the truth because I've got a little bit of time. I've gone a little fast. I struggle with being up here on Sunday mornings. I know the Lord called me to do it, but I'm so convicted about serving you. Sometimes I feel like I'd be better suited to bring you water or a napkin, make sure the thermostat's set to the right temperature. And the Holy Spirit says, son, that's why I ask you to do this on Sunday morning. I want to ask you to just check where your heart is. Are you willing to share the kingdom when you've got a platform? Or are you willing to share Jesus when you're at a Walmart and you offer to pray for somebody and the girl starts growling? Or when you're 87 years old and you've started your second ministry 
and you're texting young pastors night and day to encourage them to keep fighting the fight? Are you willing to be the, a kingdom butler? Are you willing to wash feet? If you are, you're the greatest in the kingdom. You know, Jesus tells us in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I look at moms. You are such a beautiful example of what it means to give your life for many, for your kids, for your grandkids, for people you don't even know, for kids that aren't even yours. So many good women. Ransom their lives for so many others. You see, serving others is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Do you come to be served? Or do you come to serve? As an equipping moment, we often find ourselves misaligned with Jesus' definition of being the greatest. We want to control the boardroom, but God wants to serve you in the back room. We want to stand proud before others, but God wants us to bow low before them. We can't wait to step on our enemy's toes. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I'm going to unlock two important principles for you today. If your prayer life is not always beginning with, does it glorify God the Father? Make the shift right now. Before you let another prayer tumble across your lips, begin asking the Holy Spirit, does this glorify God the Father? Does this glorify God the Father? And I will tell you when the Holy Spirit says, son, it does, daughter, it does, this is good, it glorifies God the Father, you go ahead and ask anything you want to ask, and I will do it for you, because your prayers align with the heart of God the Father. Your heart is to glorify God the Father. That's unlocking number one. Now, you want to be blessed? Let me tell you what you do. You do what Jesus told you to do. It ain't that hard. Stop overcomplicating religion. Stop overcomplicating faith. Stop overcomplicating blessings. That river of abundant blessing cannot wait to flow through you. But we dam it up. We jam it up. And we cram it up with the world. You want to break those, those barricades? Now that you know these things, now that you know these things, God will bless you. God will bless you. God will bless you for what? Doing them. Doing them. I will challenge you this week. Begin your prayer life by asking the Holy Spirit, does this glorify God the Father? I will guarantee your, your prayer life changes. And if you're looking for something to do, other than posting a little something, something on Facebook, wash some feet. Wash some feet this week.